Imagine turning on your new PlayStation. The wind chimes on the startup screen give you goosebumps. It's the spring of 1996, and you launch a game called Resident Evil, which begins, oh sh**, with a live-action cutscene. No! Don't go! When the game proper starts, you take control of your impossibly rendered alpha team member in the foyer of a mansion level that could not exist on any other console. Wow. What a mansion! Your eyes are assaulted by 3D polygons at a rate of 180,000 per second. You have been released from the bondage of two-dimensional gaming, and you are seeing the world for the very first time. It's so beautiful, you could cry. I'm Mac with the leaderboard, and this is our love letter to one of the iconic consoles of our time, Sony's PlayStation. The word revolutionary gets tossed off a lot in tech, but let's pause for a moment to remember just how high the PlayStation registered on gaming's Richter scale. It hit shelves like an asteroid bearing minerals from another universe. The PlayStation inaugurated a new era. It's as simple as that. Exactly how Sony engineered this marvel of modern consumer hardware is by now a matter of record, and the PlayStation brand has become such a giant that its early years of success are easy to take for granted. But none of it was guaranteed, as companies like Atari, Sega, and 3 can attest. The history of gaming is littered with the corpses of pioneers, because although the console wars in many ways resemble a technological arms race, good tech is never enough. Good tech can even pose a problem. If it's not readily marketable, affordable, or applicable, then game makers are in trouble. It pays to remember that gaming itself is steered by these multinational conglomerates and the warring factions that run them. We must therefore accept that some of our favorite childhood experiences originated on a PowerPoint slide. The PlayStation itself was born in a boardroom, and it it was midwifed by a senior engineer named Ken Kudaragi. But we'll come back to Kudaragi in a moment, because before the PlayStation could happen, lots of other things had to happen. Ironically, Sony didn't intend to get into the console game. Not at first. But with the acquisition of CBS Records in 1988 and Columbia Pictures in 89, it had just become one of the world's biggest entertainment companies. It controlled a vast library of some of America's most popular intellectual property, and it needed a new way to sell that content. Enter the CD-ROM. It may look like a harmless bagel toaster, but inside is a deadly donut. The CD-ROM figured centrally in Sony's global ambitions as both an electronics empire and an entertainment powerhouse. It represented the nexus of those two businesses. Sony could produce its own music and movies, manufacture the CDs to house them and the hardware to play them, and sell the packaged result directly to consumers, functioning as both creator and distributor. One of the Sony executives in charge of CDs, a man named Olaf Olafsson, realized that they offered a perfect platform for more than just traditional media. Despite costing one-tenth the price of a 16-bit game cartridge, CDs could store 10 times as much information, which meant that they were going to overtake cartridges no matter what. In 1991, Olafsson was promoted to president of Sony Electronic Publishing, the unit responsible for Sony's digital products. Among the first things he did was take meetings with the heads of major game developers. In his book Console Wars, Blake characterizes Olafsson as indifferent to the content of video games themselves. Donkey Kong and Street Fighter didn't appeal to him personally, but he understood the inevitability of interactive media in one form or another, as gaming, as education, as communication. Blake notes that video games were at minimum a kind of Trojan horse, a way to bring computation out of the office and into your living room. The size of that market was theoretically limitless. Now you get a new low price, up to $30 a rebate office, and a free pack. Is that everything? It's not everything. You can get nearly 300 different cartridges. 300? That's nothing. It's something. But it's not everything. Soon there'll be a voice module. At the same time, no company even tangentially involved in video games had forgotten about the crash of 83, when a saturation of underpriced hardware and inferior software sent industry stocks into a tailspin. A slew of publishers and console makers were wiped out in the aftermath, setting the stage for Nintendo to steadily consolidate. By the late 80s, Nintendo was enjoying a self coronation years in the making, and its grip on the global market appeared impregnable. It may be the most addictive toy in history, and it's definitely the hottest thing this Christmas. Nintendo video games. Sega soon tested that perception, but many other would-be competitors had already given up the console race. To corporate outsiders like Sony, gaming was a pointlessly dangerous gambit. So when Nintendo asked Sony for help developing a new audio processor, one that would rival the processor created by Yamaha for Sega, Sony said no. Or at least, Sony thought it said no. 
But Ken Kutaragi had other ideas. Kutaragi was a brilliant electrical engineer who had started his career in Sony's digital research labs. Thanks to his daughter's love for the 8-bit Famicom, Nintendo's original NES console, Kutaragi appreciated the vast promise of video games earlier than any of his colleagues. He knew that gaming hardware would emerge as the next frontier in consumer electronics. So he continued discussions with Nintendo in secret, and after several months, he had designed a new chip called the SPC-7000. Before we go any further, we need to pause here and acknowledge the chutzpah, the sheer cojones of Ken Kutaragi. Going rogue is not something the Japanese take lightly. Their corporate culture is defined by a deference to hierarchy and conservatism. Hatching plans with another company behind the backs of your superiors will get you fired in the US. In Japan, it'll stain your whole career. Kutaragi's back-channeling was, of course, exposed, as he must have known would eventually happen. Needless to say, nearly all of Sony's top executives wanted him gone, but Sony's president, Norio Oga, intervened to protect him. This turned out to be politically savvy, because, lo and behold, Nintendo soon approached Sony with a lucrative contract for the SPC-7000, which would become the basis of its audio processing unit in the Super Nintendo, and Sony took its first modest step towards the PlayStation promised land. Suddenly, Sony could see the wisdom in supplying parts to the gaming industry. But like all publicly traded behemoths, it exercised extreme caution when swimming in uncharted waters. Why risk an expensive and embarrassing misstep when you could ride the coattails of a proven veteran? That was the board's thinking anyway. Kutaragi himself probably envisioned a future in which consoles were a key pillar of Sony's business. But he had to operate within the confines of the org chart. So he lobbied for the next best thing. And in 1988, Sony signed a deal with Nintendo to develop a CD-ROM drive for the still unreleased Super Nintendo, which was scheduled to debut in 1990. Originally called the Super Disc, Sony rechristened this project. Those two names together are like a devil's summons, unspeakable in their profanity. But for a brief moment in time, they existed side by side. In retrospect, their marriage was doomed from the start. Remember that in 88 and 89, immediately after reaching its CD-ROM agreement with Nintendo, Sony bought up half of popular Western culture in the form of CBS Records and Columbia Pictures. The contract Nintendo had just signed made Sony the sole worldwide licensor for CD games, granting it an uncommon level of control over software software, especially considering Nintendo's infamously short leash for third-party developers. Meanwhile, Sony's proprietary audio chip was creating yet another point of leverage. By the summer of 1991, as Nintendo was preparing to launch the Super NES stateside, its venerable chairman Hiroshi Yamauchi dispatched his two top American executives to the Netherlands, where they hammered out an 11th hour deal with electronics giant Philips. To Sony, Philips wasn't just a foreign rival, it was a recent collaborator. Sony had developed the first audio CDs in a joint venture with Philips, and they had worked on the multimedia CD-ROM format before their relationship soured. Nintendo negging on a deal with Sony to pursue one with Philips would be seen by the tech world as an unmitigated humiliation, and the way Nintendo revealed this third act betrayal was colder than cold. Sony was weeks from announcing their partnership with Nintendo at the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago, but Nintendo didn't bother to relay its last-minute change of heart. Instead, it waited. At CES, Nintendo of America President Minoru Arakawa and his deputy Howard Lincoln allowed Olaf Olafsson, yup, Olaf is back, they allowed him to deliver a press conference on the Nintendo PlayStation to much fanfare. Then Lincoln took the stage the very next day to introduce the United States to the Super NES and to confirm its partnership with Sony. With with Olafsson in the audience, Lincoln conveyed how excited Nintendo was to embark on a new technological chapter with the inventor of the CD, Philips. It was ice, ice cold. Now, what nobody could know at the time is that this vaunted partnership would soon falter, and Philips would eventually release a solo product called the CDI that attempted to carve out a space between higher-priced personal computers and more conventional game consoles. Nobody knew that the CDI would go on to fail utterly, and that Bill Gates himself would call it both a terrible game machine and a terrible PC. But of course, all of that was still years away, which meant that when Lincoln delivered his press conference, things looked really 
really bad for Sony. Reporters mobbed Olufsen, forcing him to negotiate as graceful an exit as he could muster. The revelation had instantly hobbled not just Sony's reputation, but its speed to market, setting it back a cycle. Nevertheless, he was undeterred. Even if Sony never sold a single console, it still controlled all the necessary levers to make and distribute the software for what had become an indisputably booming business. Olufsen's recent promotion positioned him as head of all digital content. With the support of Sony's ample war chest, he was fully equipped to wreak capitalist carnage. Ken Kutaragi felt the same way. The PlayStation had hit a snag, but its reason for being was never in doubt. Video games were destined for the CD. Full stop. As a result, CD-enabled consoles teetered on the precipice of enormous consumer demand. A year after the CES debacle, Sony convened a management meeting to decide the fate of its hardware. Kutaragi argued for further investment in his project. And once again, he revealed a hand that nobody knew he had been playing. Earlier in the year, he had surreptitiously recruited recruited the engineers behind Sony's System G, a cutting-edge special effects engine, to help him design a console that could render 3D graphics. It wasn't finished, but Kudaragi was convinced the final product would run laps around Nintendo and Sega's next-gen offerings. This marked the second time Kudaragi had made an unsanctioned maneuver. For the second time, Sony's board demanded his removal, and for the second time, Norio Oga stepped in. Oga recognized in Kudaragi the soul of a dynamo. It was his job to ensure that this rare visionary not be hampered by petty bullshit. So Oga greenlit the console, but he did more than that. He also transferred Kudaragi and nine hand-picked engineers to Sony Music, which worked out of its own facilities in Tokyo, giving the project a comfortable cushion from the vicissitudes of Sony's corporate politics. As Kudaragi's team labored in relative safety, Sony continued to court potential partners for its hardware play. Astonishingly, those partners included Nintendo, at least in theory. When Nintendo's Hiroshi Yamauchi decided to break up with Sony at CES, he did it with the bald assurance of a prom queen. Yamauchi practiced real politique. A storied Japanese firm refusing to honor a contract was shockingly flagrant, sure. But Nintendo was the biggest game in town, and Yamauchi knew that Sony had already profited handsomely from their existing relationship. He gambled that Nintendo's chorus of critics would have no choice but to fall back in line. And he won. For the remainder of 1992, Sony tacitly encouraged stories that suggested a renewed collaboration, as though nothing had changed. In reality, these occasional missives were for show. Sony wanted to appear determined and undaunted, but Nintendo had publicly cast the die, and its status as enemy was now irrevocable. So Sony approached Sega with an enemy of my enemy mindset, hoping to find a new home for its console. But these entreaties fell flat. Though Sega had rocketed to prominence on the back of its best-selling Genesis, its success would be short-lived, and by 92, the company's hardware future had already frayed. Part of the problem could be attributed to simmering resentments between Sega of Japan and Sega of America, which often led them to work at cross-purposes. But the bigger obstacle was a divergence of opinion. Kudaragi was fully committed to 3D graphics, whereas Sega's lead hardware engineer, a man named Hideki Sato, wanted to design a console that would accommodate 2D as well. Their talks became less and less productive, and soon enough, Sega's brass put the kibosh on any hope of a deal. Sony had exhausted all possible partnerships. But Ken Kudaragi and his team plowed ahead with their design, tentatively called the PSX, while Olaf Olafsson stunned the gaming world with a series of major acquisitions, including a $48 million deal for the software developer Psygnosis. Olafsson folded these studios into a new division called Sony Computer Entertainment of America, whose purpose was to support the PlayStation's launch, and Kudaragi provided up-and-coming third-party developers like Electronic Arts and Namco with a user-friendly development kit that made CDs more accessible than cartridges. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Pack up your stuff. I got a little surprise for you here. Check it out. Nintendo's former head of marketing, a shrewd executive named Peter Main, used to say that the name of the game is the game, by which he meant the quality of a system's content would determine its success. Like all enduring axioms, this is both true and not true. Great games will always mint passionate gamers. That's undeniable. But great games are not made 
in a vacuum. They're born from a union of hardware and software, processors and polygons. Like the music that issues from a certain instrument, they are the expression of a particular harmony. Sony's foray into the console wars wasn't faded. If anything, it was a fluke. Until Microsoft followed its playbook in 2001, no other diversified conglomerate would express much interest in the space. Even companies that had supplied parts to the industry, including Yamaha and Philips, stayed away. And it's not hard to understand why. Consoles can be a brutal, volatile business. And yet, Sony created a masterpiece almost by accident. People like Ken Kutaragi and Olaf Olafsson had grasped enough of the puzzle to begin putting it together without knowing what the end result would be. They responded to the flaws of their competitors. Unlike Nintendo, they fostered open and transparent collaborations with third-party developers, losing a measure of control, but gaining the trust of a new generation of creative studios. Unlike Sega, they committed to the hardware that would best serve the software. Sony introduced the PSX to the world at CES in the summer of 1994. On December 3rd, having embraced its original name, Sony released the PlayStation in Japan, where it sold over 2 million units in six months. It was released in North America and Europe nine months later, competing with the Sega Saturn and the Nintendo 64, and it sold 800,000 units by the end of the year. It became the first console to ship 100 million units, and it generated a wildly profitable line of PS gaming systems, the latest iteration of which now sits below the TV in my apartment, beckoning constantly. Mm -hmm.